Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. We long to see the body of Christ look like Jesus. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact and donate. And don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app to be notified when new episodes come out each Tuesday. And if you would, go to the app right now and leave a rating or review. That really helps us get in front of new listeners so that they can benefit from these conversations like you have. Previous guests on the show have included Craig Greenfield, Mark Baker, and Danae Pierre. You could go back and listen to those episodes and more. But today's guest is Darren Dirksen. Darren is Associate Professor of Intercultural and Religious Studies at Fresno Pacific University. He's the co-author with William Durness of Seeking Church, Emerging Witnesses to the Kingdom, and the author of Christ Followers and Other Religions, The Global Witness of Insider Movements. Darren and I have a discussion about what he learned while researching his latest book, Christ Followers and Other Religions, what we can learn from Christ followers in various contexts, and how we can seek beauty in a culture and a place that leads to God. As you listen to this interview, keep an open mind and try to put yourself in the shoes of someone that has grown up in a place where everyone around them follows a specific re religion and then has a revelation of Jesus. So, as you do that, enjoy this conversation with Darren Dirksen. Darren, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to have you on. Thanks, Joshua. Great yeah. to be here. You know, I'd love to hear your journey with Jesus, um, and then through that, all the way through your journey and your interest into insiders um, with other religions and how people are following Jesus around the world, how'd that journey come about too? Yeah, thanks. My journey with Jesus begins with a Mennonite Brethren Church in the middle of California. And so Fresno area happens to be where I'm living in and uh, working and teaching now. And uh, when I say Mennonite Brethren, it's a branch of the Mennonites that were very evangelical, that are very evangelical. So it's kind of a, a, a blend of the two in one way. Um, and yeah, kind of a... a um, in one way, not uncommon story of growing up in the church, um, hearing about Jesus on Sunday school, making a commitment when I was nine years old that was a nine-year-old commitment, but nonetheless a marker. Yeah. And going to Christian camp, going to Christian high school, um, all these kinds of, of things, um, kind of getting out a bit for college into a non-Christian college and world. Um, in the midst of all of that, growing in my faith, um, and understanding what that meant for me, probably diversity was denominational diversity. Mm. That's probably what I was most, uh, exposed to. And really, I think early on, it would have been the only diversity I would have been aware of in my context would have been Catholics since we had so many, uh, you know, Hispanic friends and family and community around us. Post-college, I... Um, was more and more interested in ministry. And so I went then um, to Youth with a Mission and did a short-term, what they call a discipleship training school. And uh, and that happened to be in England. I, I went there and um, just fell in love with ministry and the kind of ministry they're doing. And it was international and I was meeting Christians from all over the world. So there again, diversity was really um, flooding into my world in, in some new ways. And then we're going out into other countries. And for the first time I'm encountering other religions and I'm encountering them in places where they're the majority. Yeah. And so we're going into Muslim contexts, we're going into Hindu contexts. Um, and so I'm encountering these religions. Um, but here again, it was very, very short, and I'm not making relationships with people. I'm just seeing things and making my quick judgments about them based on my own assumptions, quick teaching that we might get in a, you know, type of thing. So, I mean, it wasn't bad, but it was extremely limited mm -hmm. and uh, carried a lot of assumptions with me about the nature of these other groups. Um, and, and so... You know, and that was, it was what it was. I don't judge it too harshly, though I would certainly, you know, do it differently now and, and try to uh, 
try to train people differently who are going into those contexts now differently. But um, I think fast forward after several years of doing ministry like that, I got curious about further studies and I went to a seminary um, and did M- an MDiv and um, got really passionate again about uh, actually about my Mennonite heritage. And, mm-hmm. and really the big thing there was the church. I was really I was really passionate about the church. I'd been involved with parachurch ministries for a long time. I right. kind of had a fuzzy notion about church. <laughs> and um, I wanted to uh, learn. So I got very, very excited about, oh, it's all about the church. So so here's what I'll talk then a little bit about my introduction to insiders. I During that time, then I went back to India. I'd been to India on some short-term work, but I went to India again during my master's, my MDiv, and I was teaching at a Bible college and doing some studies. And, um, and I ran across a book by a guy by the name of Herbert Hofer, mm-hmm. um, and it was called Churchless Christianity, mm-hmm. and, uh, and it was published in 2001, and it was based on a study, some studies that he had done in the 1970s, um, and had been replicated since. And, but the, the title caught my eye right yeah. away, because I was so passionate about church, I'm like, how could there be a, a churchless Christianity, you know, so kind of grab me. But I was also intrigued because I think the other thing I was I was running up against in my passion for the church was exclusivity. And this was kind of a thing I've been feeling for a long time. It's like, okay, my, my passion for Christianity, my passion for the church, uh, I want its integrity to be there. But sometimes we, we do so much work on that that we block out what God might be doing in other yeah. contexts. So here was a book that was suggesting that there were numerous, many, many people from a quantitative study in Chennai, Madras, South India, who were Hindu and were, um, but were following Jesus. And from all that they could see from their research, these were people who in very simple ways, but still authentic ways, were really prioritizing Jesus. Jesus was their savior, their Lord. Yeah. Their own, the only thing was they just hadn't taken baptism for some various social reasons and they hadn't joined a church. So that's where the, yeah. the title came from. Now, the author wasn't arguing that this was the ideal for just individuals to be scattered around following Jesus on their own. The church is important and, and they, make, they, they make that discussion. So, but nonetheless, that really opened up my eyes to, wow, that is really interesting. Um, several years later, then I'm in North India and I come across some groups who are Hindu and they're following Jesus, but they're doing it as a group and, and a few different groups. And so this, he, this really then catches my attention. I'm like, wow, okay, what, what an interesting expression of church um, that these people are remaining part of the religious community and they're following Jesus and then they're doing it together. So this is blowing my mind. Yeah. Okay. You know, um, and, and kind of, but bringing together all these different threads of interest that I had had about the church, about um, growing interest in other religions and, and what God might be doing in some really interesting and unique ways mm. uh, beyond what I grew up with and, and understood. So I, uh, so I really started focusing in on, on those groups and just, I was, I was a disciple. I was learning from them. And, uh, and that really profoundly shaped me. So from there on, I, I, I've continued to, uh, be interested in this particular expression of Christianity. Yeah. And so when you looked up there in, in, in Northern India, you saw this group of Hindus following Jesus together. Um, and what are some of the things that you pulled out and that you started to observe from the very beginning and started to learn, um, and was really interesting to you? Yeah. Well, one was certainly they had a different definition of religion. Um, and, uh, you know, in fact, there was a phrase that many of them would often use would say, um, you know, I, I haven't changed my religion. I've changed my heart or I've changed my heart, but not my religion. Um, or God has changed my heart, but not my religion. And what they, and so I had to unpack that really listen mm-hmm. to them and, you know, what, and of course then that's being translated into English. And so there's different words being used. So unpacking that for them, religion was a much more holistic type of thing. Often what they're saying is I, 
I love my family and my community, and I believe Jesus does too. And um, and is doing some great things there, and I want to be a witness to them. Yeah. So I'm not changing out of that. I'm not converting from that that community. Um, I, I won't be practicing everything that they do. Um, I'm certainly changing my allegiances. I'm not following my family deities anymore. Um, it's now I'm I'm following Jesus. I'm reading yeah. the Bible, um, and they're and they're doing this as as a group, and you know, and they're working out some new practices together, and that's was that was the interesting thing about a church then because they come together, and and okay, what does this look like to do to do church in a way that their family who is looking over their shoulder and maybe even coming to some of their gatherings, you know how what does this look like? And one, one woman told me, she said, yeah, my, my father came to, to our gathering here and they, they called it a satsang, mm-hmm. uh, a truth gathering, which was a common Hindu name for, for that type of gathering, just a small group of people that would get together and express their devotion to their deity. In this case, their deity was, was Yeshu, was Jesus. You know, and he came to this kind of concern because as soon as they hear about Jesus, Hindus hear about Jesus, they're thinking, Okay, this is Christianity. This is a Western church. They got notions and British colonialism. I mean, there's just all sorts of yeah. things that get packed into that. So, father comes to this thing with with these preconceptions. As much. he sits down, he's like, "Oh, this this is great," you know. And and he didn't he didn't become an instant follower of Jesus, but he wasn't defensive, and that's what you know his daughter was really excited about. Um, it was doing that kind of work then where it was introducing Jesus to her family mm-hmm. in a way that didn't bring up the defenses and, and allowed for ongoing relationship and conversation. Yeah. So, and, and that's what these groups were, were excited about, you know, among other things, they could follow Jesus. They could express it. They could worship using style, language, words, language of, and, and practices that didn't put off their family, mm-hmm. but was still very, authentically biblical and, and Christ yep. following. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, oftentimes when we, I mean, for us, so if, if I'm leading a missions agency and I'm sending missionaries out, uh, that's one of the things that we're trying to help missionaries do is to have local people, uh, be the center to lead, to raise up indigenous leaders and that their discovery and what the truth is and what practices and forms that they could keep, what practices, forms that they have to get rid of, um, you know, what is the actual truth of Scripture, what is the truth of Jesus, how is Jesus Lord, and then helping them use discovery and the Holy Spirit to determine uh, what they do and what they don't do. And we don't want to be prescriptive, but we want to help them discover that. Um, so as they as they go in, it's really helpful uh, for us to actually not say, hey, this is how you have to do something. Um, Then it seems to be more authentic that that actually leads them to uh, their own cultural expression of following Jesus. Um, And we say the lordship of Jesus is actually crucial. Um, Following, you know, what does the New Testament say? What does scripture say as the whole narrative, as Jesus is fulfilling everything? And then how do we follow Jesus? But if we actually present it that way, we actually see different cultural forms take shape all over the world. Um, I know as you started to, to research and, and to write your book, Christ Followers and Other Religions, um, what, what are some of the things that you were, you were hoping for, you were looking for when you were trying to, to start to talk to different followers of Jesus around the world in different cultural forms? Yeah. Yeah. You know, let me unpack that in two different ways. I want to comment a little bit on what you just shared and then I'll come to your question. Um, and I like, I I like what you've shared because that is, I think that's the growing edge for us in Western, um, missions is to see that, you know, we have so often brought our own suitcases, um, literally, but then spiritually, theologically, and we've yeah. unpacked them there, unbeknownst to us. And sometimes we don't even realize how much we have unpacked of our own assumptions of what it means to follow Jesus, what church looks like, and so forth. So, yeah, to whatever degree we can 
try and put that on the back burner. And as we interact with people from other contexts, um, be really mindful of that. And then yeah. hopefully, you know, create a space where they can, they can discover for themselves. But on, on the flip side, I would also say that, you know, I think we live in a world now where with, with the internet, you know, with YouTube, I don't, I, I would be surprised if there are any corners of the world, and maybe there are a few, where people do not see expressions of Christianity. Uh, when they hear Jesus, and I may be overstating the case here, but I think a, probably many, if not most places, when they hear the word Jesus, they probably make assumptions. And and they could quickly go and see expressions of Christianity on, yeah. on, on YouTube or somewhere. And by and large, those are going to be Western expressions of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be even ones within their own context, you know, Indian churches that I walk into and they're wonderful. I love them. And I go in and if I were to close my eyes and block out things, because many of them would be in English, particularly if it's an English congregation, I, I could I could be back in America, right? Yeah. I mean, uh -huh. and I'm not exactly. criticizing, you know, for them that's meaningful. Yeah. But... um all I'm saying is, let's. I think what these kinds of groups, like I just described in India, are doing is opening up the possibilities. Yeah, and and I think you know we can even suggest that you know when somebody from another say, hey, you know, here's another way of here's a possible way of doing it, mm -hmm. um, because they I think people need models. Yeah, uh, to see and you know I don't think we're operating in a vacuum anymore. You know, and so I think, you know, let's, let's present different models and see, and, and then ultimately it's up to them, Yep. you know, which sorts of uh, things they want to follow, how they want to express their, their Christianity and their, their, their love for Jesus. A few years back, again, sort of out of my real interest in the church, um, I, I co-authored a book with Bill Dernis called Seeking Church. Mm. And we were looking at insider movements. Yeah. And saying, what do these movements teach us about church? And um, and and say, hey, these are these may look strange to us, but actually, what's going on inside and the processes that they're using yeah. are the same that any Christ-following group uses as they yeah. interact with their own local culture. Yeah, and uh, and so we unpack that. You know, um, every church is coming up with practices and language that makes sense of following Jesus and they do so in light of their own cultural categories. Yeah. Exactly. It's just, that's, and that's what these yep. groups are doing. <laughs> yep. so, so we were, we, we wrote that book and that was a really interesting question for me. And then from there I thought, you know, what else could we learn? Not only about church, but what else from these groups might we learn? Mm -hmm. um, say about salvation, the nature of Jesus. Um, the nature of revelation. How does the Holy Spirit reveal Himself? Uh, the nature of conversion, and um, and so I thought, you know, this these are really interesting questions, and that's what this book then mm -hmm. I decided to focus in on is to broaden it out and say these various movements that we know of and are learning from, yeah. as we listen to them and their stories and observe their practices, what might they teach us in the mm -hmm. West about? these different aspects of, of following yeah. Jesus. And, uh, and so that's, that's kind of what I wanted to unpack a bit further. That's exciting. And you come, come with a posture of curiosity of learning from them and not saying, here's the answer. I'm going to give you the answer, but you're actually learning. Um, and you're actually bringing learning back, uh, to, uh, a people that actually can, can use some different lenses to actually view, uh, who Jesus is. I think we, we will never, uh, get to the full knowledge of who God is. Uh, we will always grow in depth and understanding and we'll never get there. And right. The angels, uh, unpack and, and awe and wonder every, every day. Like, like it is incredible of, yeah. you know, this God before us and they never lose that wonder. Um, and I think we should never lose that wonder. Like God actually has some things to teach us from different cultures. He's the God of diversity and we can actually see something in an aspect of God. That's why I love living in other cultures and interacting with people from other religions um, and especially Christ followers uh, that say, you know, we worked a lot with Muslim followers of Jesus, uh, but they were true followers of Jesus. Jesus was their Lord. Um, and 
but that way of being actually started to inform the way that I see God in, in a different way. So what are some of the things that you started to see as you were interacting with uh, with these people that you were asking questions of, that you were being curious, that started to get you personally to think like, oh, I could actually see God in this different way now. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I think um, well, I could bring out a couple of examples. Um, one would be, and and I don't, I think I'd already begun thinking this through a little bit, but but certainly looking, listening to some of these groups has kind of furthered my thoughts around the topic of conversion. Yeah. You know, um, and kind of even as I shared my story uh, a little while ago, uh, you know, the way I, the way I share that has changed through yeah. the years. And, and again, even just recently, as I've talked a little bit more or, and thought through these, these stories from insiders, you know, whereas before I would have said that nine-year-old prayer, that was, that was the mark, you know, that was the, that was the time where I became a Christian. And, you know, I mean, there may be some theological, um, weight, uh, on that moment that I would still want to give, but, one of the things that I started seeing with these different groups was the importance of journey. Yeah. Um, and that was either, you know, sometimes that wasn't the word that they would use, but they would use images and ideas that really kind of evoke the idea of a journey. Hmm. Um, that, uh, and, you know, and we know this, and again, I, it's not entirely new, but it just gave me new language and images for this idea that God has already been at work. Yeah in a culture or in a person's life and and let's give way to that and let's call that out you know and and i particularly do a little bit more work around the nature of the holy spirit yeah and uh, to say you know the spirit is that nature that aspect of god that is at work not only in my life with gifts and transformation but also in other people's lives and throughout creation yeah and so wow if i was to be curious about that and go in with prayerful eyes, uh, what might I see? And um, and I think for the stories that I heard from these different Christ followers, they wouldn't deny that there was a moment, yeah. you know, usually more than one powerful moments of revelation mm. um, where they, you know, where they really got, wow, this is who Jesus is. But usually that came on the back of a whole number of other things, even beginning with their own religious tradition, the way they had begun to read and question their scriptures or see things in their scriptures that were really interesting to them, you know? And sometimes that wasn't even clear until later on. They looked back and they thought, yeah, God was already at work in drawing me to him. And even in the midst of my own tradition, yeah. you know? And, and so... Um, I think that was, that's been really interesting. You know, the other thing that came to my, that I realized as I was listening to them, I reinterpreted Acts chapter nine, mm -hmm. and that's the story of, of, of Saul, you know, um, now of course Saul's experience in context is real different. So I always want to be careful with this, but you know, Saul, when he comes to faith in Jesus, on the Damascus road and, 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 and then through Ananias, he, he is not leaving his religious tradition. Mm -hmm. Obviously there's something unique about the Jewish tradition and God's work through, through the Jews. Um, but I think there's something there for us to reflect on that for him, Jesus was not calling him to a separate path. Yeah. He was remaining on the same path. In fact, in his mind, he was, he had left the path. He was, he was, he had, he had left the path. He was yep. no longer a true Jew, a true follower of God. And this was restoring him back to that. And I wonder, and, and I, again, not that they would have put it this way, but I started seeing that in these other Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist followers of Jesus that not for all of them, but for many of them, it was as if God was saying, you know, your religious tradition got off track a bit. There's brokenness there. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm not calling you away from that, but I'm wanting to see it enriched, fulfilled, and drawn to the fullness of Christ. Yeah. You know, and um, that's that's a really powerful and different way of understanding conversion. Yeah. That we're reorienting persons towards Jesus, but on that same path, in that same tradition. It's certainly some real new changes that yeah. need to happen. Yep. Um, but... Um, but yeah, a new way of understanding conversion and how that relates to other religions. Yeah. Yeah. And that's good. And, and you, you know, follow that up through Acts 15 as then they're at the Jerusalem Council trying to figure out, right, do, can do Gentiles basically have to convert to Judaism to be able to follow Jesus? And, you know, the answer at the end was no, after a lot of debate. Um, they they have, there's a few little things that they should do. Um, but no, they don't have to be circumcised, you know, and they could start to follow Jesus in a, uh, really in a different way than being a, a Jew and converting to Judaism. So, I mean, that's really important as we move forward. And I think another distinction too, I think in the West, particularly, you know, we actually don't think that we were all born Christian, but I know in the Middle East, everybody there they're born into a muslim house they're muslim from birth um in india with with hindus they're hindu from birth uh and they are born into this religion i know when we mm-hmm. first started to interact with syrian refugees the first wo- woman refugee that we met she had a dream of jesus um and all sorts of things but we we shared the story of jesus's birth and when they, she saw that the angel said to the shepherd, I bring you good news and glad tidings for all people. She asked us, is Jesus really for all people? Is Jesus for, I thought Jesus was just for you Christians, people born into Christian homes and countries. Is Jesus really for us Muslims too? Can I follow Jesus? And the answer was, was well, that's what the angels say, <laughs> right? But yeah, the angel said that, of course, yes, you can. And then she was able to then start to follow Jesus because she had a revelation that is not just for people born into Christian uh, houses, Christian countries. Um, and so when we're talking about people in different religions, we're not talking a lot of times of people that have had this conversion moment that we think about in the West of now I have become a Christian. Um, they're, they're Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist from birth, right? So how does that help shape and form the way that they follow Jesus within their own traditions? Uh, because it is like a, a family thing and a culture thing and everybody around me is this from birth. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, yeah, that it's it's certainly a different understanding of religion, you know, yeah. like we've already pointed out. And so right there, you know, we have to kind of remember that that's the case. For them, it's very much about community, it's national identity, these kinds of things. You know, when I would tell people I'm from America, um, the United States, they would often assume, therefore, I'm Christian, you know, and, and it's... And, you know, we can debate that, but sometimes it's like, well, that's that's not the. I'm not going to go ahead and and belabor that point with them. You know, they yeah. that's just their assumption that different regions have different religions, right? So that, um, but if that's their framework, then yeah, how do we under- help them understand that Jesus is not just you know, the white person or the United States or even the Christians, God, you know, that was a interesting point. Some Buddhist followers of Jesus I was listening to were, you know, reflecting on the, one of the barriers they had to get over was that Jesus is the, is the God of the Christians. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and so, and even the Buddhist or not Buddhist, but the, you know, the, the, the Christians of their particular tribe that they were there in, uh, or, and country. Um, and so one of the, things they had to get over like you're talking about I was like well no that's not just that community it, it, it's yeah. also for you and your family Jesus is um powerful and and um interested and and, and well well and that was the other thing that Jesus would would not only answer just the prayers of the Christians yep. you know you could you could talk to Jesus too you know and in so doing Jesus will answer you 
really? You know, that was, well, no, Jesus would, you know, in their minds, Jesus would only therefore open up his ears to, you know, to that, to that community. Yeah. I mean, you know, this, this very, you know, kind of, um, yeah, the, just this kind of closed understanding that Jesus is only for that community, but only even listen to that group. Um, so number of things that were opened up to them as they started to hear, well, no, that's not the case. Mm-hmm. And then they would start to pray to Jesus and Jesus would start to answer their prayers and they would have changes in their life and realize, oh yeah, no, I mean, and I haven't even become Christian, they would mm-hmm. say, you know, but yet I'm, Jesus is answering my prayer Well, I'm following Jesus and I'm learning about him. I mean, we would say in a sense, they've become Christian, but yeah. for them, that's, that's not what they've done in the yeah. sense that they've left their community. Yeah. Yes. They start following Jesus. Jesus is listening to them. They have a relationship with Jesus. Um, but, uh, yeah, but they, you know, they're yeah. still Buddhists. So really changing up that category mm. of, of religion in some really profound ways. You had mentioned earlier about the journey that God is drawing people and Jesus is drawing them that it's actually, uh, you know, a journey. It's not a, a quick, sudden shift and change. Uh, but it, I think this is for all of us that we're constantly growing. We're constantly repenting. We're constantly moving towards Jesus in all of our life. And sometimes we fall back and, and go the opposite direction. And sometimes we go forward and go towards Jesus. And so we're all in that journey, especially of people that God is drawing uh, to himself. I'd love to go back a little bit and talk. You you said that the the revelation uh, of the Holy Spirit was something that you, you really gleaned from, learned from a little bit. What was that diversity of the revelation of the Holy Spirit that you found uh, in this journey for you? Yeah, yeah. So for that, how for them... Uh, and, and again, it's different for different persons. So I, right. I'm making broad generalizations yeah. and even among different groups, there would be differences of opinion. You know, <laughs> how much is, uh, how much does the Quran speak truth in and, and agree with the Bible and, and agree with our following of Jesus, they would have these debates. So I want to be really mindful of that and not overstate things. Um, but for many there was definitely a sense that um, that God, the Holy Spirit, had revealed certain truths in scriptures, you know, that were written down, if it was that kind of tradition, or in some of their songs, uh, you know, if it was more of a evocative, you know, oral or kind of artistic expression type of, of tradition, um, you know, that that these past persons in the past that had either written down or created a dance or whatever that that somehow they had met god in the midst of that some goodness some good thing had happened to them now they may have misinterpreted it mm-hmm. you know this is how the christ father would now see it um that that now looking back yeah that there it may not have been captured in completely the way God would have wanted someone to capture that or written it down in exactly the right way. Um, There might've been some things that got misinterpreted, brokenness throughout the tradition or, or whatever it might've been. Maybe it was misdirected to a, to a deity in a wrong way. Yeah. Um, And yet at its, at that moment in time, that's all they knew. And so that's how they were expressing it. And now the Christ follower is looking back on that and saying, you know what, there was, let's not just throw it all out. Um, Cause that would be, that would have been my tendency. And I think that's been often yeah. missionary and Western and tendency is to say, you know, it's all broken. That scripture is completely all wrong, yeah. you know? And I, I, I there's probably past times, I, I hope I never use the phrase, but I've heard others use, you know, it's, it's satanic. You know, and and really these really strong um, labels on the material and traditions of another religious tradition. And, um, you know, and so this really blanket uh, label on on all things, not Christian. And these persons are saying, you know what, that's that does such a disservice, not just 
not only is it hurtful, yep. my community, um, you know, I, I would never, they would say, you know, I can't go up to them and tell them this is all satanic. Um, there are persons in their community that have done that and, yeah. and they will, and I've heard stories of that too. Like there's the persons who have converted to Christianity and they were discipled that this is what you understand. So they go to their family and say, you know, I'm throwing out all the idols. These are all yeah. demonic and Satan. And of course, you know, huge backlash. Right. And so these others, these Christ followers are saying, you know, that's not the pathway. That's so hurtful to my family. Um, and is it really, is that really true that it's all that evil? Might God not have been a part of that in some way? Yeah. And when we throw it all out, are we missing something? And so I, I saw that that's what they were, they weren't all phrasing it in the way I'm phrasing it. This is very much my own Western theological, you know, interpretation. So, um, but, but that's how I, I saw what I saw them doing, that they are recapturing some of the goodness and the ways in which God might've been involved in, in the Quran, you know, the ways in which, um, it does speak about Jesus and maybe not always in the the most accurate way, but there's, mm-hmm. there's light, there's glimpses of it. Um, you know, there's ways that Buddhists have understood the Buddha and have different traditions have talked about the Buddha and have, and they look back on it and say, no, you know, not entirely wrong. Um, but you know, or a certain Bodhisattva, not entirely wrong the way that that particular Bodhisattva was characterized, mm. um, but not entirely right. And, and now, looking back on that, we can see there was glimpses of Jesus through that particular expression. Um, wow. Other teachings, you know, maybe on on ancestors, uh, that was a big one for me to learn and listen about, you know, what's the nature of ancestors? Um, and, and still a bit of a gray area for me, still not totally sure what to do <laughs> about that. But, you know, again, a lot of missionaries would go into some of these contexts and say, you know, your ancestors are dead either in heaven or hell and, and don't pray to them. Don't that's, you know, there's, there's nothing to do with them anymore. Well, some of these Christ followers are saying, you know, that doesn't fully match up with our understanding of ancestors. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're not systematically figuring this out, but there's still sort of this place of they're still present with us and, and we can have relationship with them. And particularly those that were Christ followers, maybe they're still guiding us in some sort of way. Yeah. From wherever they are with, with they're with Jesus and yet they're still sort of with us. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so, and they'd have stories around that. Mm. Um, you know, so that was another way of the tradition has some light to it Mm. that they wanted to capture. Yeah. And then re understand now through Jesus and through the Bible. Mm. Yeah. I think there's a few things that, you know, that we, we start to teach, a little bit for for missionaries are you know redemptive analogies is what we we call it. it's like the the things in in culture and maybe in their own scriptures that actually are divine and they point to God um, and then there are things in their culture that are are neutral they're, we call them dirt like they they could go either way like they're not divine they're not demonic um, but they're neutral and so. We could actually reinterpret those forms to say, hey, I could use these and I could follow Jesus. But some are, you know, hey, they're whatever you want to call them, demonic. We call them demonic just for an easy way, a mnemonic device, divine dirt and demonic. Um, But the things that have to actually go away when you're following Jesus, because he's and, you know, the Holy Spirit is going to be convicting us um, as we start to walk and and journey towards him. You know, but I love in in Acts. 17, uh, 26 and 27, that it, it said that he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. And I, I love that. Like it, God is actually at work and moving um, and he has allotted the the space and the time and the place, the dwelling place for people so that they could actually find God um, and that they could be drawn towards him in that place. And so just because our cultural uh, 
place of, of dwelling and the culture around us that we have actually been drawn to God because of that and that place in the time doesn't mean that other parts of the world and cultures that God is not actually at work. Um, and I think that's really important for us to to realize that we are not the ones that actually step in to a place and then all of a sudden God is at work. But God is actually at work before we step into a people in a place. Um, and then we actually have to be the people that say, how is God at work? And let's join God in what he is doing uh, here in this place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, you know, for me, I think part of my journey has been to say, there's so much that I used to be so scared of. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm really honest with myself, I think I was just really fearful. Mm-hmm. of so much and of course there's just so much brokenness in the world and 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 we 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 do need to recognize that and, and call it out um but sometimes the things that i think were wrong and broken were just simply things that i misunderstood mm. i just didn't understand yeah and i and i i wasn't curious enough to say you know let's put my quick judgment on the back burner and this just say, how might there be goodness here? You know, in addition to, I'm sure, whatever brokenness there yeah. is, because that's there as well, you know. So, yeah, I think I have, through this study and through these people, just developed a deeper wonder about the work of God. Mm. You know, the Spirit is at work. I, I've, for a long time, and I'm sure like most of us have, been at wonder about the work of God whenever I go into the mountains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love to hike, you know? Um, and, and so we, and we often do this. We'll, we'll use those sorts of images as, as, you know, uh, pictures of, ah, you know, look at what God has created, you know, that amazing mountain, that incredible Alpine Lake, you know, and, and we're quick to say, Hey, that I can see God. I could see that's part of God's handiwork. Yeah. And, and so for a long time, that's been part of my, my, my interpretive frame. I think what I've done now, what these groups have helped me to see is, you know, that's not just in nature. Uh, how might God, because even in nature, there's still brokenness even there. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, uh, that pristine lake that's also being polluted in some sort of way. Um, or, or whatever, that there's brokenness there too, but I'm not drawn to the brokenness, mm. I'm drawn to the beauty uh. in these other contra- in these other contexts, how might I be drawn to beauty and see beauty that is there, um, and not just see brokenness and, and really kind of shift the lens a little bit. That's been, I think my growing edge these last few years. Yeah. I think that's crucial and important. Uh, that we're actually looking for the beauty of God. Mm. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I, we we live in this this type of world where it seems really negative all the time, and we we fight over the things that are wrong about each other, and we actually don't look at the beauty of one another, and so we don't look about the beauty, and it's really easy to point out what's wrong. Um, yeah. And so I I love that. Hey, let's just slow down a little bit. And you reserve that judgment for a little later and start to then be curious um, and say we have a different posture of curiosity and asking questions and actually looking for where God is already at work, um, that he is doing doing that work um, and start to learn from different people and places where, you know, Jesus is being followed and he is being worshiped and he is, he is Lord and Savior. Um, how can we we learn and grow? And so I would, you know, highly recommend people to read your book so they can start to to learn and grow and to move forward uh, in those spaces. And if you could say, you know, what what's one thing or yeah, one thing that you're really hoping for your readers to get out of this moving forward to actually put into practice in their own life? Mm, yeah, yeah, I would say. Um, maybe a couple of things. Number one is just to be mindful of, of the multiple ways that church 
looks around the world and Christ following looks like around the world, including within these religious traditions. You know, I, I say in the book, and I and I continue to make the point, I, I don't write this or highlight these groups because I think they are the ideal way to follow Jesus, you know, in, in these contexts. Um, I don't know if there's any one ideal way. I just think it is, a, I think it is a way, you know, just as other expressions are. And I think what we need to have is a wider imagination of what it could look like to follow Jesus. And um, and to still say, you know, my way is is beautiful. It's wonderful. Like I, I go to kind of an evangelical type of, of, of uh, Mennonite Brethren Church here in town and uh, very contemporary. I like it. it. It's my, it's my, it's my tribe, you know, and it's, it's my vibe if I, my, my students would say, and I, I um, don't apologize for that, but I always remind myself, this isn't for everybody. Yeah. You know, um, there, there's, for, there's many people, including many people in my town for whom this would not make sense. Yeah. You know, this is not, they'd walk in, they'd say, you know what, this, in my background, this is not how you approach the almighty power, however they call it, you know, God, deity. They walk in, they say, this is, this does not feel right, you know, to them. And, um, and that's okay. And so for them, there's got to be a different op- option, you know, possibility. And um, it doesn't mean I can't invite them or, you know, I mean, God can still work. Yeah. But I, I I want to be mindful that, yeah, this this is not to judge other groups mm-hmm. too quickly. So that might be one thing I would want persons to come away with from this book is just open up their minds to, you know, there there's other ways of following Jesus. And when I listen to them, I might learn some things. Might not, it may not, um, it may change the way I actually follow Jesus. Yeah. Um, or it may just open me up to the wider possibilities, you know, even like the ways, like the ways I understand who Jesus is, mm-hmm. you know, one of the chapters I talk about the, the different images that the Bible uses for Jesus, the different names, right? Yep. And I've got my preferred few that yep. always pop up in my prayers. Um, and yet even in scripture, there's so many more mm-hmm. that I, I rarely reflect on. I've got my, 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 my few that are meaningful to me. And, uh, and then when you go out to other cultures, there's these additional images that they, they reflect on and they agree with the biblical, um, story, but they, they come out of their own cultural context. So when I listen to those stories, Mm. it helps me to see, wow, there's, there's additional ways of understanding Jesus. It might even open up the way I see scripture in new ways. Yeah. Um, and so I, I hope people would come away with just a wider appreciation, curiosity, maybe about the work of God in some other places. Yeah, I, I like this. We don't have time to unpack this, but I just want to briefly mention, you know, I've, do, I've done a lot of work in Ephesians 4 and APAST. And what I love about Ephesians 4 is that we're based in unity. We're grounded in unity. And then Jesus disperses his gifts of who he is to the body of Christ in diversity um, and so we actually need to see other people's perspectives and motivations and the gifts that they have been given and they receive, or else we actually don't get a holistic picture of Jesus or the church and we can't grow into maturity. And so, but that that grounding, that foundation is the unity of like, we have one baptism, we have one Lord, we have one God, we are unified with one spirit. Um, and so this is the the oneness that we have that we have to bear with one another uh, together in love so that we could stay together and then start to say through our diversity, we could learn from one another and see the differences uh, that we have that gives us more of a holistic picture of who Jesus is um, and who the body of Christ is and the work that he is doing in the world. Um, and so I love that. Uh, two quick little questions. Uh, yeah. If you could go back to your 21 year old self, what advice would you give? Oh, well, that's easy because that was just last year. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm 54 now. So no, that was a while back. Um, yeah. So 21-year-old Darren. Boy, Darren, you are so zealous. Um, 
and and you're really interested in how God is at work, that is awesome. That's probably where I'd start. Just a firm twenty one year old there, and like you've you've got a real um, interest, particularly in the way the Holy Spirit's at work in in you and others. I'd I'd affirm that. And I would say, you know, that same Holy Spirit, be curious about the way God is at work in other places. I'd say, get curious about you are, get curious about your, uh, the, the, the person's living right next to you and you're in the other apartment next to you, yeah. uh, the international students, um, learn from, learn about them, not just to convert them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, but, I mean, don't be shy. I mean, you know, you can express your, your love for Jesus. That's great. But also listen to them and their stories and and what their religious traditions are and and wonder how the Holy Spirit might be at work in them and uh, and just ponder that question mm-hmm. as you listen to them um and and then well how God might be seeking to lead them closer and closer to him and 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 to Jesus I just encourage 21 year old Darren to be Keep being curious, yeah. But expand that curiosity mm-hmm. to other tr- religious traditions because it's not something you have to be scared of. That's probably the other thing I'd be telling twenty-one <laughs> year old: don't be scared of those yeah. traditions. They're they're there's nothing to be scared about. You know, they're they're wonderful. They're beautiful, and sure, there's things you'll disagree with. That's okay, but you don't have to be scared about it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, anything you've been reading or watching lately you could recommend? Oh, yeah. Um, reading, I would, yeah, I would direct people to, um, the, I mean, if you're interested in insider movements, um, a great book out by uh, William Carey Publishing is called Understanding Insider Movements. Mm. It's a collection of articles Um and that's the great thing about it is just a whole why it's a big book, but it's it's a lot of kind of shorter articles that'd be great introduction to all sorts of different aspects of, yeah. of this discussion. So that's that's a great one. Um a book, kind of a shorter book that um came out five, six years ago, uh by William Durness called Insider Jesus. Yeah. Uh Theological Reflections on New Christian Movements, and he he picks up particularly on insider groups. So that's a that's another uh, great read if you're for persons who are particularly interested in insider movements. Um, stuff I've been reading, you know, um, I I picked up a little while ago this uh, First Nations version of the Bible of the New Testament. Yeah, um, you've, you've I think you've mentioned that before. An indigenous translation of the New Testament. Um, you know, it's a paraphrase. I used to love the Living Bible when I was growing up. Yeah, it's a paraphrase, but it's just I, I love it. Um, a couple others. Uh, well, certainly my my friend, my colleague here, Mark Baker, you've had him on your podcast, uh, Centered Set Church. I've been diving into that um, so much there that I'm, I'm loving. Um, there's a great book that I'm just getting into by by Randy Woodley, Native American, um, Christ following teacher, theologian. Um, and he just came out with a book called Mission and the Cultural Other, hmm. A Closer Look. And uh, just love it. He's He loves Jesus, has a, and he, he understands the church. He's been there. Uh, and now he's just really reflected in, in recent, many recent years, more and more on, on what it means to follow Christ and how the Native American uh, traditions should help us see that. Um, like kind of critiques from the colonial ways of understanding. And um, on the last one I'm kind of diving into is by uh, Kung San Tan and uh, Benno Venden Torin. Um, it's called Humble Confidence, a model for interfaith apologetics. I've just started getting into this, but um, I'm going to be in, in March. I'm going to be at a, uh, I'm going to be presenting at a, a conference uh, with uh, Kung San Tan. He's done some recent work on, on um, what he calls in religionization, basically just similar things to what we've been talking about. How does it, what does it look like to be um, deeply involved in in understanding other religions as a Christ follower? So, um, great book called Humble Confidence. I'm just getting into as well. Great, love that, 
a lot of great recommendations uh, there. Uh, how can people uh, get your book uh, and connect with you? Yeah, connect with me in Fresno. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's where I'm at. You want, <laughs> want to find me, you'll find me here. Um, and um, connect. Uh, you can buy the book, uh, of course, on Amazon. It's uh, it's published through Regnum Publishing. So if you're in the UK, it's available at Regnum's uh, website now. And uh, Fortress Press will be distributing it here in the U.S. shortly. Um, So it'll be available on their website shortly, but certainly already available on Amazon. Great. Fantastic. Well, Darren, it was a a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. So thank you for walking us through the things that you've learned as talking through uh, Christ followers of other religions and insiders of saying, hey, my Lord, my Savior is Jesus, and this is the way that I follow him. And to to start to open up our eyes and minds and to help us become curious people, to ask questions and see where God is at work uh, within other cultures and what he is doing. Uh, So it was it was great. And so hopefully people will start to become more open and curious um, and will learn and have eyes to see what God is doing around the world. So thank you very much, Darren. Great. Thanks, Joshua. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, And then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, Uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.